Hello and welcome to the Sphera Live Show. We are in Budapest, in the National Széchenyi Library, in the heart of the city. My name is Alexandra Tian. I'm a video journalist with Sphera Network. I cannot wait to introduce you to my colleagues who will be sharing the stage with me today. From protesting against femicides in Italy, to throwing paint at famous paintings all around Europe to raise awareness about climate change, we've seen youth defend their rights and fight for their liberties like never before in the past few years. And at Sfera, through the work of our partners, we had the privilege to witness this fight firsthand. So today, in this studio, in one of Hungary's oldest libraries, I have the privilege to share the stage with some fantastic reporters from all over Europe. We'll start with Italy and Poland. My colleagues will talk to us about the protests in France against pension reform and students in Warsaw fighting for their rights. And they will explain how these young people are redefining work. In a second segment, we'll go to Hungary and France. And my colleagues will talk to us about the rise of the far right and explain why it's important to be talking about this, not just in a run up to the elections. And in the last segment, we'll travel to Spain and Greece, and my colleagues will walk us on a virtual feminist rainbow. They will talk about the fight of the LGBTQI plus community and how that is part of a bigger feminist struggle. So at this point, I think I'm ready to share the stage with my first co-host of the night, Samuele Maccolini from the Italian outlet VD News. Samuele, welcome, hi. Hi, Sasha. And we'll also be joined by Agnieszka Wisniewska and Maciej Domagawa from a Polish outlet, Krytyka Polityczna. Welcome, guys. Hi. Nice to, nice to see you. So let's kickstart this live show. I think, Agnieszka, you have something to show us. Yes, exactly. We have video made by VD News. autant de manières de protester que de personnes. Donc euh, on peut toutes et tous euh, trouver un moyen qui nous correspond le plus pour, euh, pour So Samuel, what are we seeing on this video? Can you tell us? This video is the coverage by VD News of uh, the France protest uh, over the retirement uh, reform. So we went uh, in Paris uh, in December to have the opportunity to interview the people that lead the protest. I think uh, that uh, it's important to start uh, by uh, those protests because uh, uh, they enlightened the way uh, for more uh, demonstration all over Europe. And, that kind of protest also uh, posed a question, uh, a moral question, I think, uh, about how we perceive the work and the role of the work in our lives. So starting by that, uh, we can um, reflect uh, what we think in Italy and in Poland about work and the role of the students. And this uh, demonstration over uh, retirement reform, they were supported by this uh, new generation of workers. Why it happened? It was incredible to follow what happened in France from Italy, I talk for my country, because uh, one can clearly perceive how this movement was a movement of struggle, but also intergenerational movement. And they also uh, used to uh, have a joyful and playful demonstration uh, with uh, techno music, dancing, and uh, songs of fight. So I think that uh, uh, the new generation in France understood that taking rights away from their parents was like taking rights away from themselves. So they decided to play a game at the opposite uh, of what uh, Macron, the president Macron wanted. And basically, uh, they decide uh, to put uh, class struggle in front of generational struggle. And these things uh, is very difficult today because uh, the new generation usually are locked up in social media uh, in which they uh, only talk with their peers. For some people from older generation, it's hard to understand that the young generation, they don't want to work for 17 hours. Something changed in the way of thinking about work. What changed? 
studying what happened in France, I think uh, that the new generation are uh, fed up with work totally, but not only in France, uh, also in different uh, European countries. There is an example in Italy of that. Uh, there was uh, a video that went viral, a video uh, in which there is uh, Giovanna Botteri, there is uh, an Italian uh, television journalist in which uh, she precisely uh, talks about how the new generation are dealing with uh, a new meaning of work uh, and uh, fight to have uh, uh, a better work-life balance. But uh, if we don't only talk uh, about Italy, we can uh, look at uh, global trends uh, like uh, job hopping uh, or quite quitting. Uh, uh, there are trends according to which uh, uh, new generation tends to uh, do the bare minimum uh, at work, uh, to have time to enjoy life. And also these trends uh, are confirmed by uh, different surveys, international surveys, uh, all around the world. I think that uh, in a moment in which uh, trade unions are very disconnected with young people, it's like the Generation Z uh, is trying to perform a big uh, like strike, mass strike against uh, uh, their uh, companies. And I think uh, this uh, will have uh, a very strong impact on uh, the labor in the future. And are there any numbers or statistics to put this into perspective? Yes, so there are different surveys uh, all around the world. For example, there is a survey, international survey by Deloitte, in which uh, there is an evidence uh, that nearly four in 10 millennials and Gen Z uh, rejected an assignment due to ethical concern. And there are also another survey uh, from Gallup in which uh, there is uh, an evidence that uh, uh, the new generation performing uh, high level of stress uh, as 68% uh, uh, and uh, high level of uh, burnout at uh, 34%. So what we can learn by these uh, surveys is that uh, the new generation want a work that reflects uh, their values and also want more time to enjoy their life. Well, that sounds like a promising development, if you ask me. Uh, now let's zoom in on Poland. I think you have another video to show us, right? Let's stay with the new generation and let's watch the video about the students' protest made by Krytyka Polityczna. Obecnie dla studentów nie ma dobrych opcji mieszkaniowych. Nasze akademiki obecnie są w opłakanym stanie. W Polsce już tylko na UW i na AGH funkcjonuje stołówka. Stypendiów socjalnych z roku na rok przyznawanych jest coraz mniej. Ponad 60% studentów podejmuje pracę zarobkową. Students in Poland, they protest because they want to have a chance to study. What are the main topics, the most important topics that students talk about during the protests? Precisely, this is the main message when you talk to the pro protesters in Poland among students is that they want to study. But in order to study, you need something more than just lecture halls. You need um, affordable housing, you need a place to live, you need a place to eat, actually. Uh, when you look at the prices of rent, um, those are skyrocketing. It's becoming more and more um, expensive to live in big cities and this, uh, by the way, is happening all over Europe. Yep, that's true. <laughs> and um, this is clearly not, uh, not just a question of uh, taking side jobs, it's a systemic issue that we need to address urgently. Um, like, let's, let's look at some numbers. In Warsaw alone, uh, there are over 170,000 students and student housing is provided only for about 17,000 people. The facilities are very old and uh, run down. Uh, and when university is in a city center, uh, it is surrounded by places for tourists, restaurants for tourists, uh, accommodation for tourists, which is very expensive and not suitable for students. The protesters tell us stories of their friends who couldn't continue to study because uh, they either um, didn't earn enough to support themselves or because they had to skip classes in order to, uh, to do work. And uh, this meant that they failed their exams. Um, the students 
fight against the notion that uh, universities are inclusive just because uh, they are free. With such barriers, no education is truly democratic and accessible to all. What's interesting in this protest is that the students, they organize themselves, students in Poland, they organize themselves in the structure of the trade union. Why it's happening? Well, it, uh, it comes from protesters say that uh, they are not being well represented by the established student bodies. And those new trade unions, such as Inicjatywa Pracownicza, uh, are offering a chance, are giving them a chance to, uh, to, to grow and they're giving them support, structure, organization. And uh, they're very flexible. Um, and in those structures, they can fight for their rights, citizens and as future workers. Are these uh, new generations protests in Poland, are they different than what we could see 10 or 20 years ago? Well, in this, mm, with the social media, it is possible to form alliances that uh, you would find, you could find surprising. Uh, for example, during the uh, last uh, recent uh, protest against the tightening of abortion laws in Poland, uh, there was a big representation of uh, LGBT community and also anti-fascist activists. Maciej mentioned uh, surprising alliances. So my last question, Samuela, for you is, uh, what was the most surprising alliances during the protests you could see in France? What we saw in France was uh, an uh, in intergenerational and intersectional movement. Uh, I personally told with uh, different people uh, that I interviewed. And so there are a group called the Lerosi that is, are uh, feminist, but also a trade union as Force Ouvrir, but also an environmental movement called the Alternativa Paris. If we go in depth, uh, we can see uh, that uh, different part of the society of France uh, decided to join the force to make resistance against uh, the reform. And for example, Alternativa Paris uh, is a very intersectional, uh, uh, interesting uh, example because uh, uh, they uh, trying to uh, mixing uh, uh, social fight and uh, uh, environmental fight. So for example, uh, they produced a song, a techno music song, uh, that uh, they used to play and dancing during uh, the demonstration. And uh, in the lyrics, uh, there is a claim that is, uh, there is not possible the retirement in a planet on fire. So we can uh, see how the social and, and environmental fight uh, can combine. So, uh, basically, we can, we can say that uh, the, the French protest was uh, at all intersectional. And uh, we can also say that the new generation are trying to lead the protest with uh, a more inclusive and larger vision about rights. Well, thank you all for this great, interesting conversation. And I think in the uh, upcoming months and years, we'll have more protests across Europe for journalists to cover. By the way, all the videos that you saw today, the full versions are all available on the Sphera YouTube channel. I really recommend you check them out. But be careful because the French protest chants really get stuck in your head. So now let's go back from Warsaw and Paris to Budapest. Here in the Hungarian capital, many things have been happening. There's an election coming up and most recently a scandal involving a president covering a child sexual abuse caused the country's largest protest in years. And guess who broke that story? A Sphera partner, independent outlet 444. One of the journalists is joining me here today. Her name is Lili Tokas. Along with John Weiss from Street Press, our French partner, and they also have another guest joining them here today. It's Michael Colborn, a journalist and researcher for Bellingcat, based in the Netherlands. He focuses on the far right. He heads up Bellingcat Monitoring, where he oversees and leads investigations and also trains journalists in digital investigative techniques. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Hi, Hi Sasha. 
this year is the year of election in Europe and we really wonder how many members of the European Parliament will get from the far-right political parties in June. And we also want to talk about uh, smaller groups uh, in the radical right. They are often violent, they recruit the younger generation and they have a strong impact uh, in the public de debate all across Europe. So, Michael, uh, why are European elections a big deal for far-right political parties? Well, for one, obviously, European elections are quite important for far-right parties. It's not just to get new attention and new status, but it's for, for them, for these parties to get uh, more access to resources and to be able to access a bigger or more significant transnational network in Brussels and, and around the EU. For some of these larger far-right parties, what it does, actually not even larger far-right parties, but other ones as well, smaller ones, it really helps to cement their status as sort of legitimate actors in the, in the political scenes, not only of their countries, but transnationally. And it's also an opportunity for some of these, some of these parties to further radicalize more mainstream discourse in, in their countries. So, well, one thing that's important to keep in mind is that a lot of these, not just in, in this context, talking about parties, a lot of these parties are playing a long game. And looking at some of the polls in, in advance of the, the European elections uh, this year, we, we do see that there's a potential increase across the board in the EU for some of these far right or radical right parties. I think some polls are suggesting, you know, 20%, if not more, you know, an increase from very much so from, from previous years. So what's important to keep in mind for that is how will the sort of political mainstream in Brussels react? How will the, the largest political grouping, the EPP, the European People's Party, how will they react? Will they, uh, you know, will they keep a, or form like a cordon sanitaire or will they, as I think they probably will, be more open to working with some of these parties. And there's a very serious risk there, I think, of let, sort of letting, letting, these, uh, letting these cooks in the kitchen, for lack of a better phrasing, and with, with them in the picture, also a, a much more serious risk of radicalizing discourse, especially discourse around migration, not just in influencing discourse, but actual European Union policy. But, Another, this is kind of an ironic thing for me to say, I think, but a lot of times when we talk about the far right, we actually focus too much just on elections. And of course, that doesn't mean we can't and shouldn't talk about elections. I mean, hi, we're all here right now for that reason. But I think sometimes, especially with a lot of journalistic coverage and reporting of elections, a lot of times there is too much focus on just like the moment, especially when covering the far right. For example, like if a, if a far right party doesn't do as well, there's this sort of few moments and then people forget about it for four or five years and then it pops up again. We have to keep in mind that there's, you know, that, that the contemporary far right works on, like in, on, it, it works not just in terms of elections, it focuses on sort of the cultural sphere almost as like a pre-political sphere. So there is this sort of, whenever we see this iceberg of, of far-right parties, there's much more that's lurking underneath it that we need to constantly pay attention to. And that, yes, that includes talking about elections, but it includes all the periods of time between these elections. So. Michael, you're a researcher and journalist at Bellingcat. You have a global view all across Europe. Uh, according to you, what brings together all the small groups, political parties mm -hmm. in the different countries? Yeah, there's, sometimes it can be very hard, I think, as, as people know, to even define or describe what the far right is. But I think there, what, there are kind of three, three overarching principles that kind of bring together a lot of these disparate, more extreme and, and less, less extreme groups on the far right. What unites the far right in my view, is this sort of hatred or contempt for liberal democracy, a hatred and contempt for everything essentially post-1789, everything 
post-French Revolution. Talk about liberty, fraternity, you know, equality. There's just this fundamental opposition to that and having a desire for a much more hierarchical, authoritarian state and a more traditional state. Secondly, I think what unites a lot of these far-right actors is a real, like a perceived need to not just protect themselves from, but eliminate the threat of a perceived other, a capital O other. And of course, how that is expressed can differ across the far right from, you know, propagandizing to advocating and taking part in, in acts of violence against, against minority groups. And thus they, they, they their worldview is premised around defending the in-group from that perceived threat. And lastly, but certainly not least, there is what unites a lot of the far right is our issues around gender. I sometimes joke, I, I joke, but it's totally serious, I think with colleagues and other people, that when you strip away a lot of what some of the far right talks about and, and advocates, it can all be reduced down to gender. It can be reduced to what they feel the proper roles of men and women are in a society, but also a perceived, uh, with that there's a you know, complete disdain for sexual gender minorities and a uh, kind of valuing of quote unquote traditional gender roles. So if I were to try to unite some sometimes disparate uh, groups, that is what I would say unites them. So what are the links between these radical groups and mainstream far right political parties? I think there are unfortunately far more links internationally between more radical or extreme far right groups in mainstream right-wing political parties than a lot of us care to admit. Unfortunately, there are, there are so many examples that, that, that I could go through of in terms of some of these connections. Well, I think what's particularly concerning is that a lot of these connections are related to youth. Like for example, I think relatively recently or a few years ago in France, there were members of one of the then far-right groups, uh, Zouave Paris, who were effectively doing de facto security, quote unquote, for one of the far right presidential candidates. There was clear involvement there. I've written about in Slovenia, for example, where the mainstream uh, right wing party there, that's a member of, of the EPP. Uh, I investigated some of the, the, the world around their media and found that a, you know, an open neo-Nazi was basically writing for them they didn't care, which was interesting. So these links are are there on a number of levels from local to national. Uh, I mean, they don't necessarily exist all the time and everywhere, but they need to be more, I think, thoroughly investigated in a lot of different contexts. Those groups which are uh, sometimes violent in the radical right, mm -hmm. uh, you think it's a real trend, but some people say it's a passing phenomenon. Mm -hmm. What do you answer? I don't think it's a passing phenomenon at all. I think these kinds of far right actors have always, unfortunately, for decades, they've always been around. Uh, they just, in, in times before social media, they just didn't really capture as, as much attention. So what, what makes it difficult is that it, sometimes it's hard to pin down exactly, say, how many of these kinds of far right groups that there are or the amount of people that are in them on some national levels like actually what I know you're doing in, in France right now looking at the whole active club phenomenon uh, estimated like upwards of 150 in that other types of group as, groups as well. But even then that can be, you know, it can be difficult to, to put, a number, put a number on it and sometimes that makes people think, oh, the, this isn't this isn't a problem. This isn't a threat. But what's very clear from conversations that I've had and from investigations that I do across across borders is that a lot of a lot of governments, a lot of states, a lot of people are increasingly worried about actually the increasing numbers, even if it's relatively small, the increasing numbers of young men, particularly, who are being drawn into 
into some of these kinds of movements. Michael, what could be the, the impact uh, for this small radical groups in the far right if mainstream far right political parties get to power? I think there could be some very, very serious consequences of kind of intensifying some of the trends that we already unfortunately have, have seen. Uh, if some you know, far right party gets, gets to power, even if it's even if it's less extreme seeming than some of these other other groups, having them in power could mean that, and I think would likely mean that some of these smaller groups would feel a sense of impunity to go after their political foes, and they would feel much more empowered to be able to push their ideas even further in the public space and on on, on social media. They, they would essentially, some of these much more extreme far right actors, they, it would be you know the perfect opportunity for them to even keep further pushing their worldview and even trying to f further radicalize whatever far right party might have already got into power so it would it would be very concerning to say the least do you have any examples of these radical groups i have i have many yes <laughs> <laughs> too many Could you just uh, name one some? yeah one one of the the kind of transnational phenomenon that I'm focusing on these days is this so-called active club phenomenon or movement. Now, what essentially that is, it's a transnational decentralized um, far right, if not neo-Nazi movement that uh, is heavily focused on aesthetics. I, I reduce it to what are three Fs in English, uh, fashion, fitness, and fighting. So they really focus on combat sports, on preparation for, for battle against their, their perceived enemies, their perceived foes. It's a, it's, a decentral, it's a decentralized movement that has picked up across Europe, but also in North America, in a lot in the United States, and also in Canada, where I'm originally from. What this m sort of movement has, come up because having the uh, you know the justification for it, the reason why they do it have this sort of decentralized model is in their eyes to insulate themselves from law enforcement but also from media attention and another another reason why the, the, this whole phenomenon has taken place why they focus on things like fashion aesthetics and appearance is to essentially be Nazis, be fascists without looking like it. We all in our different countries have stereotypes of what a Nazi looks like. And deliberately, a lot of these kinds of uh, actors, they deliberately don't dress or, ap or appear that way from literally the way that they dress themselves to the way that they communicate communicate even when it's the same radical message. So they, with this active club phenomenon, what also makes it difficult is that because it's decentralized, there are some very, very small groups in some local environments that have the name, most of them have, would have the name like active club. But a lot of these smaller groups that are involved in this movement don't carry that branding. And so it's kind of hard to, it can be hard to pin down what a specific group, what kind of network they might be involved in, like for example, in uh, in France, there's a, a very wide network of active clubs, many that carry the exact, uh, you know, have active club before their name, some that don't. Here in Hungary, there's a, a relatively small group that doesn't have active club with as part of its name, but it is very clearly still part of that movement. And I know from conversations I've had with all sorts of different uh, journalists, uh, researchers across Europe and in, in the United States and Canada as well, that this phenomenon is growing. And it might only be, like for example, in the French context, it might only be a few thousand young men that are involved in this movement in this, or in these kinds of movements. And thus someone's reaction might be, oh, that, that's, that's nothing in the grand scheme of things. But even in a country of whatever, however big France is, 60 plus million people, and if you have thousands of young men who are trained in and willing to use violence and feel empowered to commit violence, that sort of thing can really upend and undermine a democracy. On top of that, there, so there are the political parties, there are the, the, those thousands of uh, young adults in the, the smaller groups, mm. and there are influencers uh, on right. social networks. 
they, they are more and more, they have a big audience, and let's say they, they managed to put on the table issues that were previously mm -hmm. unacceptable. Can you say that there is a cultural war in mm -hmm. Europe uh, uh, led by the far right on the internet? I think there absolutely is. The, the far right in general, I think, understands the internet and social media a lot more than the rest of us do. But influencers in general are really, at, of any stripe, influencers really are really at the forefront of driving public discourse and public opinion on issues, whether they are explicitly far right or not, or whether they would agree with that label. I look at somebody like Andrew Tate, who would certainly object to being labeled as somebody on, on the far right or close to the far right, but his extreme misogyny has, and his, his presence on social media has really helped to, unfortunately, to normalize a lot of extreme misogynist attitudes. I think what's really important for, well, for those of us who are not kids anymore, which I think is, none of us are kids anymore, is that young people today and those who are going to become young people very soon, they don't get their news or their views on the world, their perspectives on the world from newspapers. They don't form their political opinions based on what I would have done you know, 20, 25 years ago, which was read a newspaper subscription that my parents had. Now it's social media and it's especially TikTok. And the far right is aware of that. That's why, for one example, you know, there was this excellent, excellent journalism that I believe uh, corrective was the, the German media outlet that, that got in undercover into this far right meeting in Germany. It was absolutely brilliant work to be able to get into that meeting and hear what they were saying when they thought no one was listening. And there was explicit discussion in, in that far right meeting of having like a foundation or funding for TikTok influencers for the far right. So once again, I think in terms of the digital sphere, the far right, unfortunately, is much more ahead of the curve, if not a bit cynical in terms of how these technologies work. And the rest of us, you know, whatever, whether we're journalists or, or whoever we might be, you know, we need to increasingly try to play some level of catch up or understand just what it is about the power of social media that is actually helping the far right. So Michael, you keep mentioning young men. So I want to ask you, is there a gender and age element in these sort of segment of far right groups? There absolutely is. I mean, there's a reason why I've been talking mostly about young men because the far right is, you know, mostly a man's game. But what's clear is that they're there, there needs to be increasingly more attention paid to the roles that women, young, young women can play and do play in the far right. One area where you increasingly see women taking, taking a lead role is as influencers. You see that in, in France, for example, where there's, in other places, especially in the English speaking world, where there are prominent uh, far right uh, female influencers on Instagram, TikTok, places like that. What the what the far right and I, I use I use this term deliberately. What how the far right can use women is as communicators because the way again that we often think about the far right, we understandably see it as this male dominated macho space. It's very hard for most people, you know, from a European context when they hear the word Nazi or fascist or far right and think of a young, a young woman. And the far right knows this, and that's why a lot of times for communicators or even as candidates for radical right parties, as leaders of these parties, having a, having a woman in, in that position can actually really soften the, uh, the perception of a very radical message. Mm -hmm. And I mean, just to wrap up this conversation, yeah. but uh, everything you've said today, especially about the elections, uh, it's not painting a very optimistic picture. So I wonder, um, us, small media, in, independent media outlets, what can we do? Can we do anything to sort of change? You, I'm, I may not be that optimistic, but I am optimistic in what, especially local, smaller, more independent media outlets can do 
in terms of uh, you know covering covering the far right, investigating the far right, the, uh, on in a lot of countries the w one area where I'd recommend is a lot of on on the far right, they activists and whatnot, whether potential candidates, they you know if they want to have more direct influence on the political process or try to infiltrate a party, try to get on a party list. They're not necessarily going to try to do so in a big city like Budapest, where where media in the country is concentrated. Mm -hmm. If if they're smart, they would try to go to a smaller town or city, where especially in a very well a media market that's under the siege that you are here in Hungary, you know they are not going to have the capacity always to do that. That's one of the things that we're, we really try to do at Bellingcat is with our trainings, it might sound like a cliche, but we want to empower local journalists and independent media to get, you know, give and share the skills and the techniques to do it, to investigate not just the far right, but to hold, hold governments accountable at local, regional, national levels, you know, you will often in our in our national media's, we see these big investigations about the far right, and they come, understandably so, from like major media outlets in the country. What we need to to have more of are some of these groundbreaking investigations that come from less established or less legacy media outlets and. It, sometimes it might seem intimidating for journalists on a local level or with independent media to be able to match larger media outlets with those kinds of resources. You can't, but with some very clever investigative techniques and very, you know, focusing on what's important on a local level and really understanding what, what I like to call like very careful looking, very careful noticing, looking at things that might be seen as too local for a bigger media outlet, looking at those and understanding and realizing the amount of impact that you can have on, on a local level, even if it's something a national media thinks is almost beneath them. Well, I guess that gives us a glimpse of hope. A bit of optimism. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you all for this fascinating conversation on a not very jolly topic. And now off to our last destination for today, South and Europe, Greece and Spain. We've had some great stories from there over the past year by our amazing partners from a video called Transistence, which is a short documentary about the fight for trans rights in Greece and Spain, to an amazing video about a group of climate activists, Les Soulevements de la Terre in France. But today we're here to talk about feminism, and who better to do it than my amazing colleagues, Patricia Regero and Anastasia Vatsopoulou, from our partners in Spain and Greece. Welcome, girls. Hi, Hello, Sasha. Sasha. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for having us and what a very important discussion you're having already. Everything is uh, interconnected. As you already know, Sasha, me and Patricia, we have been working together for the last couple of years doing videos and other stuff. Do you remember the last time? Yes, we were in Brussels where we delivered together this workshop called Inclusive Narratives. And if you were to give a title to today's segment, what would that be? I think it would be walking on a feminist rainbow. Hmm. Look, this is a photograph from the 8th of March 2024 in one of the demonstrations in Andalusia. It says, for a transformative feminism. It's an example of how some feminist groups understand that feminism must be trans-inclusive or it is not feminism at all. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. Uh, in Greece as well, we have some uh, radical feminist collectives that are talking now about transfeminism because they want to differentiate themselves from the transphobic rhetoric and also give visibility to the trans community. For example, we have this banner here uh, in Greece from the Feminist Assembly of the 8th of March, where they hold a banner and they advocate against poverty, violence, homotransphobia, and sexism. This is what we call intersectional approach to society's issues, if you ask me. Yeah, for me, intersectional is also a keyword. Transphobia goes hand with hand with sexism and misogyny, and that is why we need to address both women's rights and LGBTQIA rights as a united front, especially now that the far right is gaining ground all over Europe. 
it really is gaining ground and you could see it with your own eyes if you were in Greece, in Thessaloniki, a few weeks ago actually, where there were two young trans people walking on the central square, minding their own business, and there were around 200 young people attacking them, handing them down, swearing, throwing bottles at them, threatening their lives basically, which is outrageous. I think this is a great opportunity actually to watch a piece of your short documentary which is called Transistence and it's about a fight for trans rights in Spain and in Greece. Let's watch we it. We see fascism in the streets. We see uh, neo-Nazis fucking up someone in the streets uh, because of his black or gay or whatever. And that's the culture they are having. The only culture they are having is the new is bad, uh, in the past things were better, and everything that is strange is dangerous for me. Uh, many of us uh, have uh, depression, anxiety, um, because we have to fight every day only to be, only to be in the supermarket with the family, and, and it's, it's really hard uh, we deal with that because uh, um, it's only to be. We only want to be. Every night I was praying, God, please, I want to be like the other gay, the girls in the, in the school, and please stop all the boys kicking my, my ass. Um, because I have fights like every day, they um, kick me a lot. And well, um, the years pass and pass and pass, and then I, um, I started praying and saying, God, please, I give you my soul, but give me only one day of, of peace. Ήταν οι πιο σπαρακτικέ αγκαλιέ. Έπαθα στα σοκ. Αγκάλιαζα χωρί να σκεφτώ. Δηλαδή, υπήρχε αυτή η συνέστηση ότι είναι ένα δικό μα παιδί, μια αδερφή μα, όπω λέμε, μια φίλη μα. Και φίλοι μα τα μεν ήταν είναι τόσο πολύ άγρια δολοφονία. Πολύ άγριο τέλο. Και σίγουρα να έχει κάποιο τρασιμπορικό κίνητρο. Και διαπιστώνεται ακόμη μια φορά ότι έχουμε πόλεμο. Και το λέω με πάσα γνώση. Είναι πόλεμος. Είναι πόλεμος διότι κάποιος προσπαθεί να επιβληθεί σε κάποιον άλλον. Χρόνια, αιώνες. Και τώρα όμω ακόμη πιο έντονο από ποτέ. Ενώ θα έπρεπε να είναι τελείως διαφορετικά τα πράγματα. Αυτό, αυτό, αυτό είναι σωστό. Κλωτσιές με το δέκα πόντα να βάλετε μυαλό. Αυτό, αυτό, αυτό είναι σωστό. Είναι και η αίσθηση που είχαμε πριν από όλα αυτά. Υπήρχε μία, ούτε δεκαετία, οχτώ χρόνια, εννιά, εφτά, που έτσι λίγο μπορεί να, να οφείλεται φυσικά και σε μια άλλη κυβέρνηση που ήταν πιο φιλελεύθερη. Έχει κάποιες νομοθεσίες που βοηθήσαν την ΛΟΑΡΚΙ κοινότητα. Ε, η, η καταδίκη της Χρυσής Αυγής, η εξοδός τους από τη Βουλή. Υπήρχε μια ικανοποιητική ατμόσφαιρα, έτσι μια ανχάδη, να το πω έτσι λίγο φίτικα. Και ξαφνικά τώρα επειδή αλλάξαν τα πράγματα, είναι σαν να σας λέει εντάξει αρκετά, πάμε εκεί που ξέραμε. 
και άρχισαν πάλι χωρίς, χωρίς καμία ντροπή φυσικά και χωρίς να κρύβονται. Να κάνουν επιθέσεις σε λάτια άτομα, να, να επιχαίρονται για μια δολοφονία τόσο άγρια. Καλά να πάθει με αυτό που έκανε, με εκεί που ήταν, με αυτός που έκανε παρέα. Δεν υπάρχει δικαιολογία στο θάνατο, ούτε χρώμα, ούτε φίλη, ούτε τι. Αναστασία, do you think it is a feminist documentary? Definitely, I would say so. First of all, Transistence features a femicide of a trans immigrant woman coming from Cuba. And one of the main feminist struggles nowadays is to say that trans women are women. Yeah, why all this violence? I think it's because of patriarchy and heteronormativity. Exactly, as the systems of domination that decide what counts and what does not count. In that sense, both women and LGBTQI people are trying to survive similar oppressions. Yeah, and which lives matter after all? This is a big question. And I would add that both movements are trying to put an end and dismantle the gender binary. Yeah, and I'm going to add something else, that both women and LGBTQI people have always been in the crosshairs of the extreme right. Not only in the crosshairs, unfortunately, but uh, LGBTQ people are brutally murdered. And I have a tragic example to share with you. Back in 2018, Zach Kostopoulos, an LGBTQ activist, was uh, murdered by conservative and far-right uh, people uh, in the broad daylight. And the queer community and the feminist movement, they gathered in the streets in order to protest, mourn, and demand justice, justice for Zach. Yeah, that is why we need institutions to act, for example, against hate speech. In Spain, we have this Ministry of Equality that is in charge of both gender equality policies and LGBTQI policies. That's great. I think there should be a Ministry of Equality in Greece too, but uh, we have a long way to go. And while we're waiting for this to happen, the EU just passed a new directive trying to combat violence against women. And if we move away from Greece and Spain, what's the situation in Europe as a whole? Do you have any data or any infographics to show us? I can show you two maps. One is the Gender Equality Index map and the other one is the Rainbow Europe map. If you have a look, you will see that countries that care about women's rights also do so about LGBTQI rights. So not everything is so dark, apparently. It feels like as a society, we are moving towards a more inclusive uh, feminist future, but uh, it, this happens very, very slowly. And according to the Rainbow Europe map of last year, the trans and intersex rights are actually at the forefront of positive change for the queer community around Europe. Yeah, and despite the awful attacks that you were mentioning earlier, it it seems like the Europe on a whole, based on the maps that you showed, uh, is moving towards more equality. And I know in Spain you have some good examples of that. Yes, I can tell you that Spain jumped six places to number four with its introduction of a self-determination law alongside the ban on intersex genital mutilation. What about Greece? Greece went also up four places uh, with the ban on intersex genital mutilation and we also we also introduced this past February the same-sex marriage law and adoption, which is a very positive uh, thing, but there is still room for progress as uh, it doesn't include all the people. I think, Patricia, you have a video yeah. to show us about this. We made a video about this, yes. It could convertirse convert pronto in the first país Orthodox in the world that permit the matrimonio igualitario. Legalizarlo fue one of the largest promises del program electoral de Mitsotakis, que fue reelegido por mayoría absoluta el pasado junio. El primer ministro griego acaba de presentar el proyecto de ley y dice que confía en que sea aprobado durante las primeras semanas de febrero. Pero no lo tiene fácil. Aunque esta ley no sea nada revolucionario y el líder conservador simplemente busque equipararse a la regulación de derechos del resto de Europa, tiene en contra a una parte considerable de la ciudadanía griega. También a muchos miembros de su propio gobierno y a los máximos exponentes de la Iglesia Ortodoxa que no son tan modernos como en el Vaticano. Dentro de su propio partido, no va democracia, que son también conservadores, la oposición a legalizar el matrimonio homosexual es tan férrea que algunos, además de votar
votar en contra, han asegurado que, de ser aprobada esta ley, dimitirían de sus cargos. Quienes sí están de acuerdo con la aprobación de esta norma son los del principal partido de la oposición, cuyo líder, Stefanos Kaselakis, ha asegurado que votarán a favor de esta ley. Y aunque Mitsotakis haya manifestado tener bastante claro que el matrimonio igualitario es una cuestión de Estado y no de la Iglesia, no parece querer cabrear más a las autoridades ortodoxas, las que se echaron las manos a la cabeza al descubrir que el primer ministro pretendía, además, ponerles las cosas más fáciles a las familias homoparentales. El reconocimiento y las adopciones de menores suponen una de las mayores trabas para esta ley, ya que para los ortodoxos los menores tienen la necesidad y por lo tanto el derecho de crecer en una familia con un padre hombre y una madre mujer. Y todo lo demás es modernización social y corrección política. Y aunque en el proyecto de ley esto se haya tenido que quedar fuera para que los defensores de la familia tradicional se calmen un poquito, el primer ministro es de de esos que defiende que es mejor ir paso por paso. Veremos qué ocurre en las próximas semanas en Grecia. So based on this conversation we're having now, it looks like things are getting better and better in Europe, but I bet it's not all rosy and perfect like a rainbow. Where's the catch? Well, unfortunately, we can say that both movements uh, are susceptible of being assimilated by the institutions. Yeah, and we really believe that both movements need to remain radical and continue asking for more and more rights and more equality, essentially. And we were talking earlier today about the rise of the far right. With this danger coming from there politically, what can uh, the feminist movement and the adjacent movements around it do to stand up for it? I think both the feminists and the queer movement, but also all social justice movements, could unite, create a critical mass, change the world and make it a better place for everyone to live and walk on this feminist rainbow. I love that, Anastasia. Thank you so much. I think this is a very hopeful and encouraging note to end our show on. Thank you, Thank Sasha. You. On this note, our Sphere Live show has come to a close. We covered a whole range of topics today, but we couldn't have done otherwise because our audience is scattered all around the continent and beyond. And what's next, you might ask me? Well, the fantastic reporters I had in the studio with me today will continue to do the great work. They will be covering Europe, climate change, social justice, and other crucial topics for Europe today. And what can you do? Well, you can follow Sphere Network on Instagram, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and stay in touch. Supporting our work is the best thing you can do. See you soon.